Welcome everybody to the second Friday lecture. Uh, this is Professor Kas Mude. He is a native of the Netherlands and received his PhD in 1998 from the University of Leiden. After that, he spent almost 10 years studying the radical right at universities throughout Scotland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, Belgium, and the Netherlands uh, before moving to the US in 2008. From 2011 to 2012, he was the Hampton and Esther Boswell Distinguished University Professor in Political Science at DePaul University. And since uh, fall of 2012, he's been the Professor of Political Science at the University of Georgia's School of Public and International Relations. His most recent book, Populist Radical Right Parties in Europe, won the Stein Roken Prize for Comparative Social Science Research. His work has been published in 16 different languages. Professor Muda is founder of the European Council of Political Research's Standing Group on Extremism and Democracy. In addition to his traditional focus in the tradi on, the, on the radical right and populism, Professor Muda's current research focuses on Islamophobia and Western democracies, how liberal democracies can defend themselves from extremist challenges, commonalities between the radical right in Europe and the Americas, and finally, the politics of OI, a genre of working class or skinhead punk popular in the United Kingdom during the 1980s. Without further ado, Professor Muda. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to stand because now we finally got the slide up. I still have to work for the slides. I want to thank you for, um, for inviting me because it actually gives me, gave me the opportunity, although under more time pressure than I had hoped for, to develop <coughs> this um, argument. And you're going to be kind of guinea pigs because I just developed this over the past month. Um, and actually, I had wanted to write <coughs> a paper on the issue of the economic crisis and the far right for a while now. Um, and I was going to present it at the Council for European Studies conference in um, <coughs> Amsterdam. Um, but then, my beautiful son came in between, <laughs> who um, already outdresses me easily. Um, and as a consequence of that, I couldn't go. And once you don't go to a conference, you don't write papers. Um, so now I tried it again. And this is very preliminary, what I will present. <coughs> Most of it are um, ideas that I know are backed up by literature, even though I haven't revisited some of the literature. Some other points I'm still looking at some data. Now, what is the issue here? <laughs> Ever since the economic crisis started, both media and academics have by and large argued that it fuels the rise of the far right. And um, <clears throat> these are some examples from media. Um, one of the top ones actually an op-ed by academics, um, even like the oracle Francis Fukuyama has declared that the economic crisis leads to the rise of the far right. So it must be true. And um, <coughs> this actually goes back to one of probably one of the most popular social science theories out there, and that is that economic crisis leads to a dramatic rise of political extremism. This kind of a truism that has been around for a very long time in academia, but also broadly in the media. It seems that everyone kind of knows this. And the evidence is Weimar Germany. 1918-33, right? Weimar Germany was the unfortunate first period of democracy in Germany after the First World War that ended with the rise of the Nazis. And by and large, whenever people talk about this economic crisis theory, they go back to that specific case. And so you had Black Tuesday in 1920, Wall Street crash, which leads to a worldwide economic crisis in the 1930s. And Germany is particularly hard hit. Its production drops by 42% and unemployment goes up 20%. And <coughs> Germany still recovering from the First World War, destruction, 
being held to very strict repayments, particularly by the French, which, which exaggerated like, this economic crisis. And during this period, like, the Nazis win big in the 1932 elections. They win 19%, and they become the biggest party with 37%. And what many people kind of forget is that the next year they again have elections, and they actually lose a little bit. But after those <coughs> 1933 elections, they get into the government. The thing that people also kind of forget is they get into the government by coalition. They do not get the majority of the vote. They never go higher than 37%. <coughs> They're taken in by other parties, conservative parties, that by and large underestimate their political savvy. And so they abolish democracy. But the idea is very, very clear. Economic crisis, right, almost without anything in between, leads to huge rise of political extremism. Now, theoretically, it's actually never that developed. Simply stated, most people say, okay, economic crisis makes people desperate, and therefore they don't believe anymore in the system, and therefore they go for alternatives. Um, but as often with received wisdom or truism, uh, you don't really need to know exactly how it works. We all know that it needs to be, so the mechanism is not that relevant. Um, there are two scholars, two Germans, who developed what they call the normal pathology thesis. And that is by and large an elaborate um, theory of economic crisis. And so their argument was, <coughs> and this was for the post-war period, but it kind of reflects um, <coughs> also the period before. And say, well, radical right values are alien to Western democracies. These are values that, that really have nothing to do with our values of today. But there's always a small potential for these. There's always a group in society that has these. Um, and they estimated that at around 5 to 10 percent under normal circumstances. Um, and this is explained by structurally determined pathologies. Very simply stated, these 5 to 10 percent cannot really deal with the complexities of a modern society. And so they seek refuge in simplistic extremist ideas. But that's all fine. Like I said, that's, we shouldn't worry about it. It's just 5 to 10 percent. It will always be there. Right? That's no problem for a democracy. The only time that this percentage can really significantly rise is during times of crisis, particularly economic crisis. Now, that's a, it's a, it's a nice theory. And it's actually, although the article itself was read by virtually no one, it's in a fairly obscure journal, 67 in German, this kind of, this kind of theory underlies virtually all the writing of the post-war radical right. Almost everyone works with this type of underlying idea. And whenever the radical right rises, almost always the, the, the argument is that there is some type of economic social crisis, post-industrialism, whatever it is. It's not been tested very much. Actually, I recently wrote a, a piece on it, which shows that, that actually <coughs> the potential for radical is much larger, uh, even in normal circumstances. What is most fascinating is that this whole economic crisis leads to the rise of political extremism wasn't even tested for the Great Depression. It wasn't even tested for the 1930s. Only recently did a group of economists run some stats on it. And although there are some major issues with the variables and what they include and what they don't include, at least this was the first time that they backed it up by looking further than just the German case and just see, okay, so. During this period, the world crisis right, affected everyone. Maybe not in the same way, but all, all countries were hit. So what did this do to democracy? Did political extremism 
gain everywhere, like in Germany. And so what they found was it was actually way more <coughs> um, nuanced. First of all, political extremism gained in those countries that had a relatively short history of democracy. By and large, countries that had only become democratic for the first time after the First World War had no experience. Like, so countries like Germany or Bulgaria, but not so much Britain or the Netherlands, which had longer histories of democracy. It <coughs> had mostly an effect in countries where they already had extremist parties before the economic crisis. And in those countries where you had in electoral systems that created low hurdles to parliamentary representation. Mostly proportional system with a low electoral threshold. Now the important part of this finding is that it already shows that this theory of economic crisis just leads to political extremism right, is not is so simplistic. It's not economic determinism. Right? As always when you talk about social developments, right, they're complex. They're all kind of different aspects that play a role. And here, <coughs> particularly if we want to learn for today, it is important to know like these kind of conditions. If it is true that this is more general, that what happened in the 1920s, 30s still holds today, like we would have different expectations of the economic crisis theory. Like if <coughs> the history of democracy is relevant, right, many countries today have much longer histories of democracies. So perhaps that they would then hold up better. <coughs> many parties didn't have an extremist party for the crisis. And then electoral systems vary, although most are the same. But what is important here is that this one-on-one -on -one relationship that is so strong in the German case right, can actually not be found across Europe. And often what we do is like we think, well, you have Germany and then you have Italy. But in Italy, the fascists didn't come to power through elections. They came to power through the march on, on Rome. And although the fascists were very popular, they came to power in 1922, which was well before the economic crisis. Right? So even Italy, the other, only other case really where fascists came to power through their domestic um, political process rather than being put in power by the Nazis later. Like, even that case doesn't support <coughs> that economic crisis theory. So I know. <coughs> In that historical context, right, I look at the current crisis. Now we know the current crisis, US sub subprime mortgages crisis leads to financial crisis, which leads to European sovereign debt crisis. <coughs> you, Europe was a little bit later, it was more 2008 that it started than 2007. As with all the crises, not every country is hit equally hard or at the same time. Um, but what is important <laughs> is that because of the Eurozone, the economic crisis has at least affected every EU member. Now, even countries that are doing well, take Germany, which does remarkably well, is nevertheless <coughs> hit by the economic crisis because of the Euro and because of the bailouts. Right, so the economic crisis <coughs> um, is experienced in all countries. We take the Netherlands. The Netherlands is doing pretty well, or was doing pretty well, except that it has to pay phenomenal amounts of money in bailouts, which drain it from other things that it needs that money for, like stabilizing its economy. And so while it took a couple years more for the economic crisis to become really dominating Dutch debate, it does at the moment. Two years later than in, than in Ireland or in Greece, and we don't have the same type of unemployment or poverty, 
but the mood is a mood of crisis, and the Netherlands has been in recession. And so the link is made most notably through the 2012 elections in France and in Greece. Both had two elections. That helps the, the hype even more. <coughs> so in 2012, the Front National in France, under its new leader, Marine Le Pen, the daughter of Jean-Marie Le Pen, uh, did remarkably well in the presidential election, and then probably even more remarkably well in the parliamentary election afterward. And then Golden Dawn, which is kind of a neo-Nazi party, we will talk about a little bit more, <coughs> did decently in terms of percentages in the 2012 elections twice, around 7%. <coughs> it was just so shocking because they are so shocking. But what journalists always do is when one far-right party wins and within roughly a year another one wins, there is a trend. There's a wave, and they call me and ask, why do we have this wave? And I will have to tell them that their colleagues called me three years earlier and asked me the same question. And I had exactly the same answer, and they've been doing this for 20 years now. And I will tell them there is no wave, because in those two periods, there were these, these, and these far-right parties that lost. But you don't cover them, because that doesn't sell newspapers. <coughs> so this was really what helped this whole story. Right? When the, particularly the Front National, which gets a lot of attention in the media in general. And Golden Dawn got all that attention because A, it's Greece, right? the worst hit country of the crisis. And Golden Dawn, if you not have seen them, then I would say Google them, and you will see some of the most frightening videos. They are really, really evil. <coughs> And so this was the proof that we needed for the story that we knew was true anyway. Like we knew that the economic crisis led to political extremism. And now we have it. I mean, within one year, two successes can't go wrong. So I looked at the numbers. And um, roughly, <coughs> this is a slide of the changes in electoral success from the last election before the crisis, so 2005 to 2007, and the result or results after the crisis, 2009 and further. 2008 is kind of a difficult year because it depends on when the election was and the specific country, whether it was in crisis mode or not. What you by and large can see is that we don't have that clear image. You see countries where the far right lost and countries where the far right won. Actually, if you go <coughs> in detail, of the 28 EU member states, first of all, eight have no far right party. They have no far right party to speak of in the sense that either it doesn't contest elections at all, or it doesn't exist at all, or it gets like less than 0.1%. Right. So that's already quite remarkable. Even during this crisis, right, you have 8 out of 28 that actually don't have a far right party. What's even more remarkable is that only one of the five bailout countries, one of the five countries that got a bailout, so that's the worst hit economic crisis, has a far right party. Ireland, Spain, Portugal, and Cyprus, none of them have a relevant or have a radical right party. It's only Greece. But of course, Greece is kind of like the prototype. Right? I mean, Greece is the lens through which we see the horrors of the economic crisis. So we kind of generalize on the basis of that. But it's the exception, even within the bailout states. And you would say, well, if economic crisis leads to a significant rise of the far right, the bailout countries would be the ones where you would expect it most, rather than the northern countries that are hit a little bit. Now, of the EU states with a far right party, which are 20, 
11 show an increase and 9 show a decrease of far right success. So it's almost 50 50 percent, 50 50 of those EU states with a far right party where they fit the model. But of those 11, only five have a somewhat significant increase, namely over 5%. And if the economic crisis theory is really, some, I mean, is really about crisis rather than economic development having an influence on voting, right, crisis is a big change in economic, it should have a big change in electoral support. Even 5%, I would argue, is a very conservative estimate. I mean, an increase of 5% is relevant, but it's not shocking. Right? So only 5 out of 28, it's about 17%. In 17% of the EU member states, the, fee the crisis theory holds up to some extent. Let's look at those five. The first is Finland. Finland actually has one of the largest growth, 15%. And it's around this party called the True Finns. The problem with the True Finns is <coughs> they're at best a borderline case of radical right. There's a lot of debate at the moment about whether or not they should be included as radical right or populist radical right, whatever your term is. Um, the main reason why we have that debate is because no one studies Finland and Finnish is completely incomprehensible to virtually <laughs> everyone. So we have virtually no one who actually knows something about the party itself. What it, it is a party that came out of agrarian populism. And it now took up some anti-immigration sentiment and very strong Euroscepticism. Now, some anti-immigration sentiment and strong Euroscepticism is not necessarily enough to be radical right. Any good conservative party these days has that. That would make the conservative party in Britain, a far-right party, ODS in the Czech Republic, all kinds of others, right? So even if we count it, this is like a borderline party. If this is like the worst extremism that we get, <coughs> it's not that convincing. The other two parties, uh, two countries where the far right won significantly were Austria and France. And <clears throat> clearly these are, these are two of the prototypical contemporary radical right parties, like Front National and the FPÖ, the Austrian Freedom Party. These are the two like, mainstays of the contemporary right. So there's no debate about whether they are far right or not. But both Austria and France are actually not that hard hit by the economic crisis in the European con context. They hold the middle. Interestingly enough, whereas the whole debate about <coughs> Europe has been about East versus West since 89, the crisis is actually not a debate about East and West. In fact, the East is almost completely ignored in this whole debate. It's all about the South and the North bailing it out. <coughs> Actually, the East does some of the bailing out too. But there are two countries that are particularly hard hit in Eastern Europe, and they're Hungary and Latvia. And so, <coughs> this would actually also confirm that economic crisis. That would also apply to them. There are two buts about them, though. Hungary had a political scandal, much more than an economic scandal, before Jobbik, the movement for a better Hungary, got at 16.7%. And the crisis that it created <clears throat> was not about economics. Um, what happened was that the prime minister of that time, a social democrat, was videoed um, <clears throat> by someone in secret while giving a speech to pretty much his cadre and saying that he had lied about the political, the economic situation in Hungary in the campaign. And so that went viral and that led to very violent <coughs> um, 
protest from both the mainstream right, Fidesz, and Jobbik. And so, rather than those elections being about the European economic crisis, they were much more about a political crisis in Hungary where the elite had, had lied to them. Whereas Latvia has seen an uprise of a party called the National Alliance, which is actually a, a merger with a conservative party, and therefore this increase of 7% is, is kind of difficult <coughs> because the party changed much. But actually, it got its big result in the year that the Latvian economy was actually going up again. So <coughs> in the year 2010 when they had elections and Latvia was still in a recession, they didn't do that well. In 2011, <coughs> when the Latvian economy actually grew, the radical right did well. The point here is, is that first of all, we're talking about a minority of all cases where the economic crisis at least holds some sway. And in those cases, right, <clears throat> they are not necessarily the strongest ones either because there's a lot to be said around it. So how can this happen? Right? Why, why, are, why are the Nazis not in our streets today? So in theory, the economic crisis leads to a crisis of legitimacy, as Habermas has called it, of the system. So the idea of the economic crisis theory is that the economic crisis makes people doubtful about the political system, about democracy. Right? And so the victims of the crisis look for opposition outside of the discredited system. They want an alternative to the system. And that's how they get to the extremists. Because it's the extremists that actually provide an alternative to the system. Right? The Nazis, or the communists for that matter, were not Democrats. They didn't claim to be Democrats. Like they, they railed against the democratic system, arguing that democracy <coughs> was the rule of mediocrity. Like if everyone would vote, you would by and large get the lowest common denominator. So rather you should go to the leader, because the leader knew best for the country. So that was an alternative to the system. It was not saying, well, you have the system, we just need a better leader. No, you just need a completely different system. So that's the theory. The reality, though, is that the economic crisis in virtually all cases leads to a crisis of legitimacy of the political elite, not of the political system. In most cases, both in Europe in the 30s and definitely today, people don't want an alternative to the democratic system. They want an alternative to the democratic elites. And so they look for an alternative elite within the discredited political system. Which would mean <coughs> radicals. Radicals are people who still believe that democracy is the best way, but they have issues with, as with certain aspects of it. Most notably the parts of the liberal democracy, like minority rights, constitutionalism, those kind of things. But there is another element to it. And because in this theory, what you would see is not so much the rise of neo-Nazis or the rise of communists, but you would see the rise of right-wing populists and left-wing populists who defend popular sovereignty, majority rule, but say that certain aspects of liberal democracy should be um, changed. <coughs> For example, I mean, left-wing populists argue more for collective rights than individual rights. Sometimes they want more constrained capitalism. <coughs> Most right-wing populists today rally particularly about minority rights um, <coughs> and about constitutional protection of minorities. Now, 
this didn't really happen either, because most of the parties that we've been talking about are radical right parties rather than extreme right parties. <coughs> Front National is not against democracy. It's totally fine with popular sovereignty and majority rule. It is against rights for minorities, which they think Muslims are, for example. However, it doesn't happen. And so let me to take two cases and then explain why. The Netherlands had elections um, in 2012. And um, in 2010, Geert Wilders, who is this handsome fellow, <coughs> had a massive electoral victory. Went up to 15.5%. And Geert Wilders is the personification of Islamophobia. Um, although he has since broadened his appeal and now also rails against East Europeans, um, at that point in time, he was almost like a single issue politician who just went against Muslims and Islam, says that the Quran is a fascist book and should be banned, that kind of thing. So he did really well. But the mainstream parties didn't want to get him into the government officially. So what happened, the Conservative Party, the VVD, went into a coalition with the Christian Democrats and formed a minority government. They did that with the support of Geert Wilders, who got certain policies but wasn't officially part of the government. Worked pretty well. But in 2012, after two years, they had a deal that they would renegotiate the, the agreement they had. And because of phenomenal pressure from the EU, it included a lot of austerity measures. And so Geert Wilders said, I don't want that. And pulled the plug. Now, we have a saying in Dutch <coughs> that whoever breaks something pays the price. And that is generally our wisdom about, about letting governments fall. That if you're the one that terminates the government, you will be, you will be punished in the next elections. Because Dutch are kind of, although it might sound odd, we're actually kind of conservative. We don't like things to move too much. And so <coughs> that seemed to be the case at the beginning. As soon as he pulled the plug, the whole elite media, politics, everything, directly blamed him. It's how irresponsible that he did this, etc., etc. But he seemed to have a good card. Because what he said is, I cannot do this because this will make the Dutch people, who he refers to as Henk and Ingrid, which are two, like, actually not that common Dutch names anymore, <laughs> um, but they stand for the Dutch nation, the native. Dutch nation, obviously. Um, and we cannot have Hank and Ingrid pay for the insanities of Brussels. Right? So rather than making this really an economic issue, he made it an EU issue and a national sovereignty issue. And that was not unpopular. The Dutch don't like the bailouts. However, we had a ridiculously short campaign. You might want to try that in this country one day. Um, <laughs> Government fell late April. Next elections were in September. As you know, Europeans have holidays. So the Dutch go, by and large, for vacation for five weeks in which you don't campaign. So really, the campaign was only three weeks. After all, the Dutch came back from Europe with their caravans. <coughs> the campaign started. And from the beginning, it was not about the EU. It was about economics. It was about austerity versus subsidizing. It was about pro-bailout or anti-bailout. And Wilders dropped. And in the end, lost a third of its vote, only got 10%. The other radical party, which is the Socialist Party, a radical left party, which actually isn't that radical anymore, but it was also a Eurosceptic party, also lost. It actually got completely obliterated 
lost more than half of its support, <clears throat> in part because its new leader did horrible in the debates, but in part because he did horrible in debates because they were about the economy and not about Brussels, which was kind of what he wanted to talk about. Keep that in mind when I try to explain it. Now Greece, on the other hand, is a very different story. Greece seems to really confirm that economic crisis. And what happened in Greece <coughs> was that you had two elections. You might remember that in May they contested elections. And on the same night, I remember sitting in a coffee shop just watching the results. I, I just love watching the results. I never vote myself, but I love that everyone else does. And after that, it was directly clear. It was truly 50-50 split between those in favor of the bailout and those against. And so two days later already, everyone knew we need new elections. This was the outcome of that. And what it really meant is a very similar type of development as what we have seen in Weimar Germany. You see a growth of left and right alternatives. Golden Dawn is an extreme right party. It is not a democratic party. Although they don't openly see Kyle anymore, and like, the Hitler posters are also removed from most offices now, it is a neo-Nazi party. Right? That is the first neo-Nazi party elected to a national parliament since 45. We focus always on the Germans, but neo-Nazis in Germany have always been irrelevant. Even today, the NPD. We're talking about Golden Dawn having about 7 8%. Today, in the polls, they are around 18%. They're the third largest party in Greece. That is amazing, and that is Weimar-like. Now, on the left, the picture isn't that clear. The Communist Party of Greece, KKE, is a truly extremist party. For some reason, they st are still Stalinist. But they didn't do that well. They have 6 7%, but they always have had that. The other party that is the big winner is Syriza. Now, Syriza is a kind of a radical left party, but it's a coalition of coalition of a coalition. So within Syriza are actually more than 10, if not 20, different kind of groups. Some are communist and anti-democratic. Others are not. I would say overall, though, Syriza has radical left, because actually the alternative that it presented was an alternative that wasn't feasible, <coughs> but nevertheless didn't go too far. So their alternative was, on the one hand, you had stay in the EU, but take the bailout and therefore the memorandum conditions. The other one was go out of the EU so that we don't have to have the mem memorandum. And Syriza <coughs> said, no, actually, we're going to take that bailout, but we're not going to do that memorandum thing. And I was like, yeah, that's nice. I mean, the EU all the time said that is not happening. But what is important about that, that's actually a radical alternative. Like, by and large, you say, I'm going to stay within the EU. I'm going to stay within your larger political framework. I'm just going to shake that up. But overall, like, if there's any country in Europe where you see really the alternatives pushing the boundaries of democracy and gaining, it's here. Similarly, you see a decline of the really democratic parties. This is what was often forgotten about Weimar Germany. To a certain extent, Weimar Germany was a democratic country without Democrats. The vast majority of, of Germans didn't support democracy and voted for non-democratic parties. Not just the Nazis, not just the communists, but the major religious party, Centrum, Center, Catholic Party, was also anti-democratic. There was virtually, virtually no democratic party. Today you have a little bit the same in Greece. The two parties that for decades gained about 80% of the vote a new democracy, kind of a conservative party, and PASOK, 
an odd type of populist social democratic party. PASOK has been almost completely wiped out. And together, these two have about 30% of the vote. And even PASOK could be argued to be not a real democratic party. It is a very clientelist party that has misused the state to by and large buy voters. Liberal parties, liberal in a European sense, which means kind of more libertarian in an American sense, have com been completely wiped out. The only real social democratic party is only about five, six percent. So you see not just that on the, on the radical sides there is huge growth, you also see that in that democratic center is kind of disappearing, exactly as in Weimar Germany. There's also a declining trust in the democratic system. To be honest, looking for data at the moment, fortunately I have a Greek because Greek is even more difficult to read than Finnish. Um, <coughs> But what we have seen over the last years is a huge growth of people who just, they don't just <coughs> are unhappy with the government, they're unhappy with the political system, with democracy. Interestingly enough, the other country where you have that, where it's very high, is Hungary. And Hungary is pretty much the only other country that has a very strong extreme right party. Jobbik is also not really anti-democratic. And as I said, you have a growth of extremists today, Golden Dawn being 18%. They're only coming after Syriza, the radical left party, and New Democracy, the conservative party, which is the last standing kind of mainstream party. So this is as close to the Weimar Germany <coughs> similarity as we come. The point is, well, many journalists push the idea that Greece is the future of Europe. Greece actually is the exception. There are historical reasons why Greece is where it is today, and we can talk about that in the Q&A. But there are no indications that the other countries are following this, not even the other bailout countries. Right? Both in Spain, Portugal, Ireland, there are no radical right or radical left parties gaining hugely. The democratic center holds, <coughs> trust in democratic system holds. So are we all good then? Well, not really. Because actually what happens, and it's in part because of course I also need to publish stuff, so <coughs> although I've made my career by arguing that the radical right is not that relevant, if everyone else is starting to believe that, I have nothing to say anymore. <laughs> but there's actually a reason why the radical right does not do that well during the, election, during the crisis. <clears throat> there are several scholars who have argued before already that the far right profits from economic prosperity. One of the first ones to notice this was Seymour Martin Lipset in 1955 when he wrote about the radical right here in the US, most notably <coughs> the anti-communist um, right. But it's also ducked away in Ignazi's famous 1920, uh, 1992 article, The Silent counter Revolution. And um, the argument is linked to probably the most famous <coughs> theory about contemporary party politics, that's Inglehart. What Inglehart argued in the silent revolution was that building upon Maslow, famous sociologist who had a hierarchy of needs, right? And so what Maslow argued that first of all, every human being is trying to get food, because otherwise you die. Once you actually have eaten, you try not to be killed. So you take care of your security. Once you have taken care of that, you go up, you go up, you go up. And so Inglehart said, looking at like the new social movements of the 70s and the Green Party, is that why are people busy with these kind of things? Right? 
Well, they can be busy with self-actualization, as they called it, post-material values, like the environment or gay rights. They can be busy with that because all their other needs were met when they were socialized. Now, <clears throat> and so they focus on social cultural issues. The thing is, Engelhardt was speaking about the Green parties. But actually, as Ignazi argued, you can see the radical right as a social cultural kind of post materialist phenomenon too. In the end, the, the radical right opposes immigration and all kinds of other things, not because of economic concerns. First and foremost, these are cultural concerns. These are about identity. That's what post-materialism is about. <coughs> but what do crises do? Economic crisis brings socio-economic issues to the top. What you can see if you look at the Eurobarometer, <coughs> in 2006, 2007, issues like crime and immigration right, completely disappeared. It was all about the economic situation, unemployment, healthcare system, etc. Logical. That's what your debate is about, and that's what the concerns of the people are about. Now, the point is, socioeconomic issues are secondary to radical right parties. They don't emphasize them particularly. They don't actually stand out on them. Most radical right parties support, by and large, a mainstream kind of social market economy, which the Christian Democrats support, and to a certain extent, both the Social Democrats and the Conservatives do. What they stand out in is in their welfare chauvinism. They want that welfare state only for the native people. But that is actually not a social economic issue, that's again a social cultural issue. And so when everyone starts to talk about social economics, right? The radical right drops because they have nothing to say. They're not trusted on that. As far as they have issue ownership, as far as they're perceived as being the best party on an issue, it's on issues like crime, immigration, perhaps European integration. Not on unemployment, not on socioeconomic policies. So that's the reason why they do so bad in crisis. However, what happens after an economic crisis, as Engelhardt has said, those people, those post-materialists, will return to prioritizing social cultural issues. That means that the Greenies go back to the environment, but it also means that the radical right people go back to Islam. Right? Um, thank you sir for first of all for your presentation. Um, I have a question about the Weimar comparison. The German newspaper constantly read this comparison. You focus on economic issues, but I'm wondering whether you see any other parallels on different um, issues that might be legitimate in comparison between Greece and Weimar Republic, because, um, well, Weimar was not embedded in the European Union. Greece has now a record of a few decades of democracy. There is no equivalent to a German deutsch uh, legend. Um, there is no Versailles Treaty, so whether you can uh, just have a short uh, remark, uh, or remark on, on whether you see any other parallels to that. I would actually kind of disagree on the Dogstos. Um, so the, what, was, what was crucial was to the Weimar Republic was kind of national revanchism, and uh, there was within particularly the right wing within, within Germany, in Weimar Germany, there was this idea that the Germans were not really losing the First World War, but the, the elite had capitulated and thereby stabbed the German people in the back, right? And so it was this kind of betrayal, national betrayal, together with being dominated by foreign powers, like the Versailles Treaty um, and um, the, the huge re repatriation of, of France. That is actually what Greece has to a certain extent, right? In Greece, both on the left and the right, you have that thesis like, that, that Greece was kind of doing okay, but it was the elite that got greedy and then sold it out to the foreign banks and the EU. The other thing is that the memorandum right, is very much compared to the, to the Versailles Treaty, as in like, 
the memorandum <coughs> states what Greece can and cannot do. Like, to get bailout money, uh, you have to live according to rules. And these are very strict. But what is more important is, in politics, it's not about what is, right? but, but what you think is there. And so how it is constructed. The memorandum is constructed as a, a surrender of national sovereignty. And so there, I think that is a similarity. With regard to the short, um, <coughs> the short history of democracy, no, I mean, Greece is democratic since 1972 or three. However, <coughs> various studies have showed that the type of democracy that Greece had was always subpar to any other country, including the other South Southern European, including uh, Portugal and Spain. PASOK <coughs> created a huge clientelist state, um, which in the end, new democracy by and large just copied because it was the only way to compete. And <coughs> so some Greek political scientists argue that democracy, liberal democracy in the sense that the rest of the EU had, never really caught on in Greece. Now they don't necessarily provide survey evidence that Greeks didn't really believe in democracy. Um, but if there is one country within, within Western Europe right, which <coughs> had a really dysfunctional democratic system, it definitely was Greece. Um, and so I think there, there are even there similarities. Not, they're not identical, right? but they're similar processes. I have a question about differentiation between the far right and the radical right. Because yeah. um, I feel there's, I need a definition because there is a difference, but I don't really yeah. see it. Sorry, I didn't make that clear. I actually am moving using the far right because at the moment I work a lot on both on like what I called in the book populist radical right parties, but then also some groups, neo-Nazi groups or other groups which are different. And so my terminology is that extremism or extreme right means that you're anti-democratic. You don't believe in popular sovereignty and majority rule. Radical means you're anti-liberal democratic. You accept popular sovereignty and majority rule, but you reject certain core issues of liberal democracy like pluralism, minority rights, rule of law, constitutionalism, those kind of things. I use the term far right to, to encompass both. However, I have no definition of far right, which is horrible, but I, 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 publishers always want very simple things, and so they want me to write about certain things and then include something else, and they say, oh, but you can do that, and I say, no, I can't because I make my whole career on defining things and this messes up my definitions. They don't care about that. Um, <coughs> actually in this, if I write about, if I would focus only on the radical right, I would have to keep Jobbik and Golden Dawn out. Mm -hmm. Whereas although I think that they're fundamentally different, I think they're functional equivalents in the sense that people vote for these type of parties for similar reasons, largely. So that's how my terminology is. Um, picking up on what you just said about, um, about Greece, uh, would you say that it's not actually about the economic crisis and isolation, but it's rather about all the other things um, and all the other problems of Greece democracy that are triggered into a crisis through the economic crisis? Because that um, would fit in really well with the comparison to Weimar, um, where we can I that Sorry, um, would, you, would you say that in Greece the problem is not the economic crisis in isolation but rather all the other problems that underlie Greece democracy that are exposed and triggered by the economic crisis? Because that seems to me a much more accurate description too of what happened in Weimar in the late 20s and 30s. Um, I, th I think in Greece, like in Weimar, it was a, cri a crisis of democracy. It was a crisis of the political system. In the rest of Europe, it's a crisis of the elite who leads the system. 
And I do think that the economic crisis is crucial to it, but if the economic crisis would not have <coughs> a European dimension and bailout, I don't think it would have had the same effect. I think the fact that, it, that the economic crisis is linked to bailouts and a memorandum gives it a different type of discourse. It's now no longer just a discourse of how do you get out economically, it's a discourse about do we get to decide on how to get out of it or do foreigners, the Troika, get to get to decide? Have we been betrayed by our national elites or not? So it's no longer just a matter of being incompetent or corrupt. Right? The debate gets this national um, sovereignty, national identity issue to it, which I think was, was essential in uh, the Weimar Republic as well. So I do see strong similarities. At the same time, I don't think that Greek democracy is going to fall. Let, let me be absolutely clear about that. But I do think that there are similarities there that you just don't see play out in the other countries in the same way. Sit the back. Uh, thank you very much for focusing in your lecture today on the Weimar Republic. Um, when people ask why is it that Hitler came to power, the answer is the Weimar Republic. It happened in those 13 years. And I'm glad you emphasized the economic uh, consequence all that. But though it, it, economic, uh, the economy was a very powerful factor in making possible national socialism, you would agree there were also additional factors that I'm sure you didn't have time to, to get into. You know, the more World War I and the consequences. I have a, a question for you. You talk repeatedly about the right, the political right parties in Europe today. And um, what I see, in particularly in Eastern Europe, to give only one example, is that the right-wing parties seem to discriminate against minority groups, particularly the, the gypsies. And uh, there's also a rise in anti-Semitism, as you know. Why is it that the discrimination against the gypsies continues after hundreds of years of discrimination? And why is it that the governments in Europe remain rather indifferent to that discrimination? Uh, that's a biggie, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Roma are incredibly easy scapegoats because they truly are different in all aspects, in the sense that they stand out phys physically, except perhaps in Romania, they hold very different values, they live differently, and they, um, I mean, and Romophobia is age old. I think one of, one of the reasons why Roma discrimination has endured is in part because the Roma have been, <coughs> um, I mean, Romophobia was under communism existed because groups felt that they were privileged by uh, the communist regime. And after that, actually one of the effects that the EU was obsessed with the Roma issue. Now it was the European Parliament, which we know has no power. So they write endless reports and they send people there to scorn local politicians. Um, but in the end, don't change anything. But many people in Eastern Europe were very upset because actually during a very hard economic time, Right, where by much everyone went through a difficult period, West, Western European governments and the EU came to them and said, you should really invest more money in the Roma. Right, and they said, well, we don't even have money for ourselves. Why would we invest it in these people who are actually not even grateful and they steal and whatever? Um, I think that that created more tension. I must say Romophobia is though in political terms, not really that central. It is very widely spread. Every single survey shows that Roma are the most disliked group in Czech Republic, Hungary, Romania, <coughs> um, Slovakia. 
um, but very rarely used, um, some on the radical right do, in the mainstream much less. It is often local mayors of mainstream parties who will say it. Um, it I mean, it's just a very perfect stereotype, and it's a powerless group. Right? Anti-Semitism will, will create a response because they have a powerful group speaking for them. The saddest thing about Roma is that no one speaks for them. They don't have a government, they don't have a state, and no one else cares for them. <clears throat> so it's almost like low-hanging fruit, in a sense. Now, with regard to anti-Semitism, I think it's a bit more nuanced. There are certain countries where anti-Semitism is significantly on the rise, most notably Hungary, but it's always been very high in Hungary. I mean, Fidesz, well before its market right-wing turn, had anti-Semitic people reasonably high up. MDF before that had very anti-Semitic people. If you look at um, surveys about anti-Semitism, Hungary stands out in one way, is that education has no effect. Globally, all prejudices are very much mediated through education. In Hungary, you actually have a U-curve. The least educated and the highest educated are the most anti-Semitic. It's always been the case, as far as I know, and I don't study anti-Semitism in, in great detail, anti-Semitism hasn't been remarkably uh, <coughs> uh, prominent in Poland or Lithuania, or Slovakia, Romania, countries that you would imagine. I'm not saying that there are no anti-Semites there. I don't say that there are not politicians who sometimes make an anti-Semitic statement. But it's only really in Hungary that it, it's, and Jobbik is like, profoundly anti-Semitic. Among Fidesz, Fidesz leaders, there have been several people, people making anti-Semitic statements. Um, you actually just mentioned education, which is what I was going to ask you about. I find it fascinating that Finland had such a uh, rise in the far right um, recently. And um, it's interesting because Finland is such a generous welfare state. People tend to be quite happy there. Um, and also, they... Um, it, it's not really against immigrants as much as it is like within their own country, like the Swedish-speaking Finns that they tend to have like this problem with. I just wanted to know like what you think accounts the most for this rise in the far right within Finland when they weren't really hit that terribly by the recession. As well, to some of the other countries, they were actually hit by by a recession before the economic crisis. Right? <clears throat> um, the thing is with Finland, one of the things you have to keep in mind is that Northern Europe had mass immigration much later than the rest of Western Europe. And so Finland, as far as it has immigrants, they almost all came in the 90s. They're mostly refugees from Somalia and Iraq. And so the whole issue of multiculturalism uh, has hit Finland like 20 years pretty much after the rest. And so it only really started a debate about immigration fairly recently. The other thing is that the European Union, the bailouts have, <coughs> have that is, the true Finns is much more about, about unhappiness about Europe and about bailouts than it, than it is about immigration. <coughs> and I'm not completely certain what that is. It could be, right, that as said, they had their economic crisis before the economic crisis, right? They went through that period by themselves, no bailouts, right? And now they're kind of, they finally do a bit better. And Europe is saying you should pay for the other ones to get through. And I'm like, wait a minute, I mean, you weren't there when, when we needed you, and now we have to pay for someone else. So that, that might be it. I think, I think it, there is not structurally anything Finnish about that. Um, <coughs> it's also that this is a challenger to age-old parties that have not been challenged in a very long time. Yeah. Sorry, I wanted to come back again to the Weimar Republic and the memorandum of uh, European Central Bank, IMF, and European Commission and, and the Versailles Treaty. So you said that it is a crisis of political system because it's a loss of democracy and national sovereignty. So I'm wondering whether this is an empirical finding or this is only the perception of the Greek people 
because at the end of the day, the Greek parliament can decide whether it accepts the conditions or not. And of course, the Greek people are free to vote for parties which then decide to not accept the conditions and introduce a new currency. So there is no 100% obligation, there is an alternative. So um, is that comparison completely legitimate? Or? Oh no, I said, I mean, it's a construction. Like clearly, Versailles was not put to the vote of the German people, <laughs> right? Um, but at the same time, there are very real similarities between the Versailles Treaty and the memorandum. Like, I mean, we act pretty casually about the bailouts and what they mean. But if you look at the memorandum, <coughs> it means that all major decisions are checked by the Troika. Right? The, the political space of the Greek government has nothing to do with what we think that democratic governments do. Now, the, as the issue is they voted for it. Right? Right? That's true. At the beginning, though, there was virtually no alternative. Imagine you're just a mainstream Greek. Right? You believe in <coughs> a free market with some welfare state, whatever. And you're, but you're against the memorandum. You can vote for Golden Dawn. Right? It doesn't sound very attractive if you are actually a Democrat. Or you can vote for Syriza, which also doesn't sound very attractive. So if you want to have a party which in virtually everything else is kind of like you, you only have your options of, of mainstream pro-bailout parties. I mean, I'm a Eurosceptic. Hello, I'm Kass, I'm a Eurosceptic. And um, <laughs> in the Netherlands, I, I cannot vote on Euroscepticism. I cannot vote for Geert Wilders because I'm not an Islamophobe. Right? <clears throat> so I, I have, as a, as a democratic Eurosceptic, right, I have no voice. And in the end, I'd rather stay in the EU but not mistreat my Muslim compatriots right, than get out of the EU or get less EU and completely make part of my population second rank citizens. Right? And so the argument of you have a choice is actually on Europe really isn't that often the case. Germany is a very good case. Where do you go when you're a Eurosceptic in Germany? Exactly, but then you also have to live with a whole kind of other baggage. That's true. And kind of going off of what you were just saying, I'm wondering um, to what extent if economic crisis has an effect on other parties and adjustments of their platforms, moving uh, more or less conservative, um, the rise of Islamophobia, for example, um, becoming something that's more, um, more prominent in other parties that might not have really used it. The interesting thing about Islamophobia <coughs> which, and, and sadly enough, is not studied that well and that much, is that actually Islamophobia is not about economics anymore. Right? Europe doesn't have immigration. We, by and large, have banned Im economic immigration since 1973. We have refugees who are virtually impossible to get into the country. And we have family reunion, which has diminished significantly lately. We don't really have any, an immigration debate. There is some big business that wants blue cards and stuff. Overall, all parties are against immigration. We have a debate about integration. And the Islam debate is about integration. It's hardly about their unemployment even today. It's all about gay rights, gender equality, them being odd. Right? And so, that is not so much there. What is there is East European immigration. And so what you see as a consequence of the crisis, there is much more opposition <coughs> to free travel from Bulgarians and Romanians, most notably, as well as Poles. This is very strong in Britain. Britain was one of the few countries who actually let Bulgarians and Romanians come in unrestricted, whereas virtually every other country restricted that, even though that goes against the essence of the European Union. And so what you see now 
is that you see a lot of movement ag against that. Because that is actually touching the economic situation. Those are people that take your jobs. Right? <coughs> so I think the Islam debate is, is actually, and if I look at the last years, the Islam debate is much less than was before the, the last couple of years before the crisis. Um, even Geert Wilders started to go after the Poles and the Bulgarians. Um, because that is what people associate with taking away our jobs. Right? When, put it bluntly, those are our Mexicans. Right? Not so much anymore the Muslims, because the Muslims are second or third generation Dutch people. Even the Islamophobic voters of Geert Wilders understand that you can't kick them out. Like they are Dutch, however painful that is for them. They just want them to not be so Muslim anymore. Right? So <coughs> I, I, think, I think those two have become really separated these days. And when you look at Wilders, he hardly ever even speaks about the unemployment. He speaks about their crime. They're all potential terrorists, and they all beat their wife and beat up gays. Like that is pretty much where it's at. And they're a fifth colony of global Islam. But it's not about stealing our jobs. So I think the movement is, is with regard to Eastern Europe, with regard to any accession. I mean, if you want to be really suicidal today, you should bring up the issue of the Turkish accession. I mean, or any other country, by and large, because that is really what the European crisis has done. I think it has a profound effect on European integration. Uh, it, it has made the support for Europe and integration diminished significantly, even though the Eurobarometer now again came out that it was all good. Eurobarometer by arch is untrustworthy <coughs> on that. It goes down, it has made people way more aware of what, it, what they're actually in. Like before the crisis, even well-educated people, which I think I am, had no clue about the, me the, the mechanism of the Eurozone. We had no clue that if Greece was in crisis, we had to pay for that. Now everyone knows. So the next time someone wants to come in, let alone Turkey, right, you just see like, whoa, that's going to be expensive. Right? And they're not going to take care of the, themselves. So I think there will be profound effects, but the effects will be on European integration. What there will be, I don't know. And whatever I would predict would pretty much not happen anyways.